When we left off last time, I'd taken my Lotus Elite apart to try and fix an ignition fault that was stopping it from running. In this video, I'm going to show you what I found, what I've learned about the ignition setup on these cars, and then we'll talk about where I've got to with the car and where we go from here. Last time I got as far as taking the distributor cap off, which doesn't sound like very much, but on these cars it's so buried under the airbox and the carburetors and behind a load of fuel hoses and stuff that that's actually quite a lot of work. I do get though that that's the price you pay having a crowded engine bay for such a low bonnet line, which gives it the looks and it gives it the 0.30 coefficient of drag and it gives you the 160 brake horsepower out of a normally aspirated 2 litre engine, which was pretty damn fine for the mid 1970s. I came in for some stick on particularly a Lotus owner's Facebook group for saying nasty things about Lotuses, but normally getting the distributor cap off is a terribly simple job. It will be a five minute piece of work on, on more or less any other car. So I stand by my frustrations. Anyway, that doesn't matter. What matters is have I fixed the fault? So let me tell you what I found. Looking at these plugs, they're very sooty and that says to me that there is incomplete combustion. Now we've got suppressed HT leads and we've got the old plugs have an R in the code which means they've got a resistor in them so that's belt and braces you've got two lots of resistance added there one in the HT leads uh, and one with the extra resistance in the plugs you don't really need both that's reducing the amount of spark that you get. And the other thing is that the old plugs were gapped for about 0.6 millimeters, which is correct for the contact breaker ignition that's standard on these early cars. But this one's got electronic ignition, so it can take a fatter spark and a bigger gap. And the correct spec for the electronic ignition for the later cars is 0.9 millimeters. So we've got, a, we've got a narrow plug gap and we've got two lots of radio frequency noise suppression going on. So that's all adding up to a smaller spark than you would ideally want and that in turn will lead to incomplete combustion and this buildup of soot and it's that buildup of soot on the plugs that's stopping it from running smoothly and I don't even have a radio for the uh, RFI emissions to interfere with sadly. This car should have a Philips Turner lock radio but with the addition of a microphone under the dash as well so that you can dictate memos for Sylvia and the typing pool to deal with when you get to the office. I'd love to put it back to that original spec but those Turner lock radios with dictaphones are rocking horse teeth so that might not happen or it might cost quite a lot of money if I can find one. It's probably not top of the list of things to do with this car next but I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Meantime I've got a new set of plugs that don't have a resistor in them because I don't need both and I've cleaned up the rotor arm with some contact cleaner and a thousand grit sanding sheet to remove the carbon deposits that would have been causing the unevenness in the spark that I saw on the ignition telltales. Let's put the ignition system back together and then get the airbox back on and then we'll see whether we can get the car to run. I don't care how incompetent the Facebook group thinks I am, I still maintain that getting this airbox reassembled requires world champion octopus wrestling skills. A whole load of these bolts can't be seen and you can just about feel them if you've got long bony fingers, which fortunately I kind of have. Being a Lotus, uh, Colin Chapman's philosophy was never to have a component do one job we didn't get it to do two or three. This locking bar underneath is what the throttle return spring anchors to, so that's pulling against you as you're trying to assemble it. You have to disconnect that and the top one well certainly on this car it's got a fuel hose cable tied to it but I think I might have done that myself so that's probably my fault. It is just a case of getting it lined up and past all these hoses and located over all the bolts so we got there in the end. I couldn't find the torque settings for the plugs so I've just gone with tightening them up until the washer starts to make contact with the surface and then giving them uh, the guidance was between 3 8 and 5 8 of, of a turn, so half a turn or two quarters, just to crush the crush washer and get good contact but without over tightening it so that you damage either the plug or the head. Then the leads go back on easily enough and I know I've got them in the right order because of my handy little labels that I made and now we can see what happens. <laughs> running a lot smoother, it's more responsive, uh, it's less prone to a little hesitation than it had before, so I'm, uh, I'm pleased with the effect that that's had. I think uh, 
mainly just changing the plugs, but the adjustments I've made should stop them from sooting up again so, so quickly. So hopefully it will stay on song for a decent while. I still need to fix the coolant leak. That's going to be a fairly significant job. One of the leaks is buried in the nose of the car, just above the radiator. The other one I need to take the uh, inlet manifold off. So we'll do those next, I think. But that then raises the question of what do we do after that? Maybe I should start by telling the story of how I came to have this car and why it's in the state it's in. I bought it about four years ago. It was, uh, it was drivable and it uh, even had an MOT, uh, although I'm not wholly sure how. I bought it sight unseen on eBay and I paid a few thousand pounds for it, uh, which was not unreasonable for a running one of these. It ran well enough to drive itself up onto a trailer, but I wasn't brave or perhaps stupid enough to try and drive it any great distance. About the first thing thing I did was book it into Lotus Bits for some basic remedial work that it clearly needed and, and a good check over and an opinion on it before I decided whether or not to commit to a lot more spend. And their opinion was that it needed a bunch of work but that it was worth doing because fundamentally it's a sound car. It's never been restored. Uh, it has had various bits of maintenance work done to it of course over the years but it's also been off the road for various spells on and off since somewhere around the 1990s. It came with a fairly fairly thick history file that uh, enables me to piece some of that together. So I spent about half as much again as I'd paid for the car on some basic work. They checked everything over, they uh, rebuilt the head, they rebuilt the steering, they overhauled the brakes. Uh, so basic work that meant that it could run safely and reasonably smoothly. Reliably was a bit more of a stretch, I guess. Um, it needs more work to do for that. Uh, it needs the diff replacing because this one's a bit whiny and uh, it needs quite a lot of rewiring work. Under the dashboard here in particular is a bit of a dog's breakfast of various bodges over the years. And the other thing about it of course is the cosmetics. So it looks very ratty. Uh, it was originally Lagoon Blue which is a really nice metallic. Somebody's repainted it I think with a roller or something or a brush with a blue that it might be a lotus color but it's not a 70s lotus color it's a 60s one if it's even that the paint's been just rolled on really thick and it's cracked and uh, is just flat and generally horrible i don't mind the ratty look i mean if you ask me what my dream car was when i was a youngster i would probably have said that 911 targa that william hurt drove in the big chill which ran well enough but looked a complete mess and was completely disreputable uh, and i quite like that look really um, so i don't mind it but this car does deserve better the most important thing that makes this a sound car is that it has a replacement galvanised chassis. It hasn't been dented or bent. These Series 1 Elites had a mild steel backbone chassis as the original factory fitment and they rusted terribly. They're also very easy to damage if they've been jacked up carelessly, so watch out for all of that if you're thinking of buying one. The fiberglass shell doesn't have any major cracks or other damage either, and the car's only done around 80,000 miles. I signed up for a car that was looking a bit shabby, was fundamentally sound and a decent basis for a rolling restoration, if you like. Uh, and that's pretty much what I've got. I use it reasonably regularly when it meets me halfway and fires up. I've done some longer journeys in it without any major incidents. A fairly significant minor incident where the headlamp switch burned out in torrential downpour in the dark on the M3 and I had to spend the night in the last room available at the Flea Pit Hotel at the service station so that I, before I could continue the rest of my journey in daylight. But that kind of thing happens with old cars. It's not fair to pin that on Lotus by any means. My frustration isn't that it's an unreliable car. There's nothing that goes wrong with it. It isn't reasonably to be expected in a 45 year old highly strung sports car at all. And it's all stuff that could be sorted out just as I work through the snagging list of remedial work that needs doing. It's just that it can be a little bit awkward to work on. When it's running smoothly like this, there really is no other car like it, certainly in my collection. The noise, the feel, the position, the looks you get, just the feel-good factor of the car is uh, it's just fantastic. 